What's up, my people? Today, we are covering a lot of ground, starting with the big reveal of our New York Comic Con exclusive, followed by a Villains Month breakdown of every evil Batman from the Dark Knight's Metal series. So in the words of the wise Samuel L. Jackson, Hold on to your butts. Now, what if I told you that we're partnering with Whatnot and the creator of Deadpool to bring you a New York Comic Con exclusive Captain America homage cover for Captain America issue one? Well, you better believe it, because that's exactly what's going down. We announced last week that Variant has partnered with Whatnot to create a shop where we can bring you high-level exclusives and limited edition collectibles. And we are stupid excited to tell you that for our first drop this Friday, October 13th, at 1 p.m. CST, we will be bringing you guys an incredible lineup of exclusives and limited edition comics. With the big ticket being this Rob Liefeld Captain America 1 variant cover, which of course is an homage of his legendary Heroes Reborn Captain America image, from 1996. Rob Liefeld actually revealed this a couple of weeks ago on comicbook.com and the geek and collectors world about lost their minds. I mean, just look at that chest. Well, outside of grabbing one from Rob Liefeld himself at New York Comic Con, the variant Whatnot Shop will be the only place you can get your hands on one of these extremely limited trade and virgin issues. But also included in our epic first drop will be these Whatnot exclusive Battle Damage Batman and Superman handmade by robots vinyl figures and 17 other limited run variant comics by artists like Boss Logic, Drew Zucker, and Paolo Villanelli, and more. To grab one of the Rob Liefeld Captain America 1 variant issues and any of the other high demand pieces in Friday's Big Drop, just click our link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to download the Whatnot app and set up a free account. Then follow Variant Comics and turn the notifications on so you're notified as soon as the drop goes live. Remember, this is going to be a first come first serve. And again, these are extremely limited. So we highly recommend you be set up and ready to go when the drop hits this Friday, October 13th at 1 p.m. CST. Happy hunting, and we'll see you there. Now let's dive into the origins of the evil Batman from DC's Dark Knight's Metal event by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. And just so you're not freaked out, this episode will be a compilation of several episodes we produced over a two to four year period, so you'll see the evolution of Variant as a bonus feature. To give you a brief summary of where these evil Batman came from in the Dark Knight's Metal story, a doorway to the Dark Multiverse was open and began releasing Batman's worst fears into the real world. And that is where the various Dark Knights come in, as they're evil amalgamations of Batman and other DC characters. And I'll also add, they're pretty freaking awesome. But that leads us to our first evil bats in Batman The Red Death Issue 1. The beginning of the comic is set in an alternate reality, or more specifically, Earth-52, where we see this Earth's Barry Allen Flash running away from someone who's shooting ice, fire, and all sorts of stuff at him. One would assume that it would be the rogues, but that would be wrong. Well, at least partially wrong. Because the person attacking Barry actually turns out to be this world's Batman, armed with all of the rogues' weapons. Batman is doing this because he wants the Flash to give him the Speed Force, so that he could travel back in time to save his parents and all the Robins that have died. But Barry's all like, nah bro, I've tried that before and it never ends well. Now if only the CW Flash had gotten that message, but I digress. Anyway, Bruce ignores Barry's warning and continues to attack the Flash, but this time in the freaking Dark Knight Returns Bat Tank. Side note, this has easily already become one of my favorite Dark Knight Returns homages in a comic. The other one being drawn by Greg Capullo in Batman Zero Year. But back to the issue. Batman manages to inject Barry in the leg with a freezing formula developed by Mr. Freeze. This stops Flash long enough for Batman to strap him to the Batmobile, which has a repurposed cosmic treadmill attached to it, allowing Batman to harness Flash's connection to the Speed Force. As Batman puts it, I will race into the Speed Force and steal it from you. Bang, Batman. That's cold. Regardless, Batman does just that and robs Barry of the Speed Force. After this, we see Gotham City at war and Scarecrow terrorizing an innocent couple. But just as he's about to stab them, Batman, now Red Death, arrives and punches the Scarecrow in half. Yes, you heard me correctly. He punches the Scarecrow in half with his fist. Red Death then proceeds to kill other villains in Gotham, including Riddler, Penguin, and Man Bat. And as he's doing so, he realizes that Gotham and his entire world is breaking apart and he's not fast enough to save it. It's at this moment when he hears another voice telling him, our worlds aren't meant to last. They are destined to die. It's a cruel law of nature in this place. You can feel it yourself, can't you? Your time is meant to end now. But what if I told you there was a world far, far above us that was destined to live, to which Red Death says, 
Tell me more. Judging by the way his speech bubbles look and his reference to his master Barbados, I think it's pretty safe to assume that this mysterious voice is coming from one of the other Dark Knights, the Batman Who Laughs, who then brings Red Death to Earth Zero, the first world of the multiverse. And once in DC's main reality, he starts terrorizing all of Flash's loved ones, like Iris and Wally West. This of course leads to a fight with the main Barry Allen Flash, but thankfully Dr. Fate steps in and saves Barry by teleporting him the heck out of there. Red Death then says, it won't save you, we'll fight again Flash. Barbados foretold the end of our story. I will turn Central City into the home I lost and save my Gotham. Okay, having evil Batman Flash is all kinds of amazing by itself, but can we talk about how cool it is that instead of having lightning coming off of him when he runs, it's freaking evil bats? Evil bats that apparently suck the life out of you. It's so beautiful, it brings a tear to my eye. But let's pause right here for a second because if you love comics like we do, you want to preserve and protect your investment, which is why I'm so excited about today's sponsor, CBCS. When it comes to comics, they literally do it all. Don't believe me? Let me give you the top four ways CBCS can help immortalize your key issues. Number one, CBCS is a household name in comic book grading services. They provide professional and unbiased third-party certification and grading services for your comic books. Like you see here with these three beauties, most notably, this this 9-8 Planet Comic Con 2018 exclusive Dark Knights Metal Issue 5 signed by both Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. Number two, their verified signature program where you could have non-witness signatures expertly verified on your comic books. Number three, CBCS offers top-notch comic book and comic book magazine pressing and cleaning as an add-on to your grading submissions. They use the safest methods to press and clean your collectible issues to ensure they grade at their highest potential. And number Number four, raw comic book grading. For those who want to know the exact grade but not encapsulate the comic books, CBCS can provide the same high standard grading without encapsulation. Your books are expertly graded then placed in a sealed mylar bag with an official CBCS grade and tamper evidence seal. But comic book grading isn't all they do. You can grade comic book magazines, RPG materials, original art, and so much more. Just check it out for yourself by submitting your comic books and magazines today to experience outstanding grading, encapsulation, and pressing services. Visit cbcscomics.com and use code VARIANT15 to get 15% off each signature for the CBCS Verified Signature Program, or click our link in the description below. Now let's talk some evil Batman Cyborg, or better known as Murder Machine. His origin is given to us in Batman the Murder Machine issue one, with a comic opening up on Vic, aka Cyborg, having a talk with his dad. His dad is all like, I'm super smart and I can help you with this mysterious new metal that the League and Blackhawks are trying to figure out. I can also help protect you from my office at Star Labs. Vic's all like, no, it's too dangerous for you to help at first, but finally just gives in. Right after this, Vic sees that Batman has just teleported to the Watchtower, but he quickly finds out it's not the Batman he knows. It's actually an evil Batman Iron Man. It's not. It's actually an evil Batman cyborg, but tell me he doesn't look more like an evil Batman Iron Man. I mean, he's got repulsors on his palms and everything. Anyway, it's right after this, we get the Murder Machine's origins, which took place months ago in the Dark Multiverse on Negative Earth 44. It's here we see a crap ton of Batman's rogues gallery, like Killer Croc, Two-Face, Harley Quinn, Bane, and so on, beating the crap out of Alfred, asking him to tell them where Batman is. He doesn't, of course, so they beat him to death. Bane even breaks poor Alfred's back all Nightfall style. Now, of course, Bruce is extremely upset about this and wants nothing more than his surrogate father back. So he tells Vic, a few years ago, I began a scan of Alfred's mind to create an artificial intelligence that might outlast him. But it was never finished, and he called it the Alfred Protocol. He then says something to the effect, I can't bring him online alone, Vic. I need your help. Please, he was like a father to me. Talk about pulling on the heartstrings. Flashback to the present, we see that Cyborg is getting his butt handed to him on the Watchtower by Murder Machine. Then back on Negative Earth 44, we of course see that Vic helped Bruce get the AI Alfred up and running. The one problem is that this artificial Alfred is killing every last person it sees as a threat to Bruce. Popping up in multiples, saying, how may I help you? How may I help you? It's pretty creepy actually. So it kills Bane and every last inmate in Arkham Asylum. Pretty messed up, right? but awesome at the same time. Because this AI is basically doing what Batman could never bring himself to do. At this point, Cyborg comes to Bruce and says, this was never what the artificial Alfred was meant for. It was supposed to stitch you up and make sure you ate dinner. We have to stop it before it goes any further. We have to deactivate it. But Bruce is like, we don't have to destroy him. I could fix him. I could make him better. I already lost him once. I'm not gonna lose him again. Cyborg then says, look Bruce, figure out a way to break through. I'm gonna find a way to fight from the outside without letting either of us get too vulnerable. Whatever you do, do not let them in. But as we all know, the AI Alfred did end up infecting Bruce. As Bruce said, I still remember the fear when they surrounded me. 
I realized quickly that my plan was not going to work. I would not be able to affect the program in time. And when they grabbed onto me, started to spread through my body, I was foolish enough to scream in fear. Bruce then explains that this program fixed that, taking away his ability to feel fear and sadness. The artificial intelligence even started rebuilding Bruce, replacing his human flesh, making him stronger as the comic says. Again, kinda creepy, but awesome at the same time. We then see that the murder machine is destroying people left and right on his world, and even destroys the Justice League. And to top it off, he even ripped his world's cyborg's head right off his body, all Mortal Kombat style, with his spine still attached and all. But Murder Machine would come to find out that his world was destined to come to an end, like all of the other Dark Knight worlds. But he learned of another which he was currently attacking Cyborg on, which is Earth Zero, the first world of the multiverse. Back in present time on Earth Zero, Murder Machine gets the help of the other Dark Knights to subdue Cyborg. At which point they all proceed to beat the crap out of him, cutting off his arm and everything. And then the comic ends with the murder machine having taken over the watchtower and transforming it to look like an evil bat skull of some sort. Now let's move on to the evil Batman Green Lantern hybrid known as Dawnbreaker. This evil Batman's origin starts off on negative Earth 32 in Gotham City. In Crime Alley to be exact, where Bruce's parents were murdered in cold blood by Joe Chill. But in this reality, Bruce became extremely pissed, saying, I feel nothing, not even fear, and that there was just a void inside of him. As this pissed off young Bruce takes off to chase Joe Chill, a Green Lantern ring appears saying, Bruce Wayne, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. So Bruce becomes a Green Lantern, and with his new power ring, tries to kill Joe Chill. But there's just one problem, the ring wouldn't let him kill. Saying, error, first law of the Green Lantern Corps, lethal force, not permitted. But Bruce didn't care and was just like, kill him. I don't care what you say, he deserves to die. And while trying to force the ring to kill him, the ring keeps saying, error, willpower at 100%. Error, willpower at 117%. Error, willpower at 181%. Until his willpower overloads the freaking power ring and it says lethal force enabled and he obliterates his parents killer, literally melting him alive. Can we just talk about this for a second? This is by far my favorite part in the book. I mean, his freaking willpower was so strong it overloaded his power ring, allowing him to use lethal force. So cool. After this, he tries to bring his parents back to life with his new ring, but it doesn't work as the ring is just manipulating their dead bodies, which is all kind of creepy. After this, we could assume some time has passed and Bruce now protects Gotham, not as Batman, but as a Green Lantern. The problem is he's all about killing his enemies and even says, I killed without remorse or boundaries. Why did they deserve to live when my parents did it? Then there's one panel where you see Bruce grab the penguin, then fly him into space and leave him floating there to be torn apart by a freaking meteor shower. How unbelievably crazy is that? When I first read this, I was like, oh my God, that's extremely clever and disturbing all at the same time. Anyway, when Jim Gordon questions Bruce about his methods on dealing with criminals, Bruce says, shut up, Gordon. You have a daughter, right? Sad, she'll have to grow up without her father alone and then freaking obliterates him. Again, this version of Bruce is freaking ruthless. Right after he kills Gordon, a crap ton of Green Lanterns show up, including the Guardians. And they're all like, hand over your ring. You have done the unthinkable. You let darkness into your ring. But if there's one thing we've learned thus far, it's that you don't want to mess with this Bruce's willpower. With that said, he overcomes the Green Lanterns and the Guardians, ripping one of their heads off. Straight savage. And with that act and creating a huge power battery, he becomes Dawnbreaker and then recites his oath, which is as follows. With darkest black, I choke the light. No brightest day escapes my sight. I turn the dawn to midnight. Beware my power, Dawnbreaker's might. And just like that, you have the origin of Dawnbreaker. In the rest of the issue, you just see the Batman who laughs recruit Dawnbreaker to be part of the Dark Knights and wreak havoc on Earth Zero, where he almost defeats Hal Jordan, but Dr. Fate saves Hal in the nick of time. This was another solid origin and evil iteration of Batman, but let's keep the train rolling with the origin of the Drowned. We get the Drowned's origin in Batman the Drowned One, where we find ourselves on Earth Zero. Right out of the gate, we see this evil Batman Aquaman hybrid quite literally drowning Amnesty Bay. She does so by vomiting water from her mouth, all exorcist style, which is really disturbing, but awesome nonetheless. I also really like the design for the character. It looks like she's straight out of the Pirates of the Caribbean films, which is very fitting. Anyway, it's during these first several pages on Earth Zero that we learn her name is Bryce Wayne, and that on her Earth, her lover is Sylvester Kyle but he was killed by Metis. And obviously Sylvester Kyle is the male version of Selena Kyle. So literally everything is just gender reversed on her world. 
When Aquaman finally shows up after she sank Amnesty Bay, the drowned even says, an Aquaman. Gender roles are reversed here. Then after she trades some blows with Aquaman and Mera, we are given her origin on Negative Earth 11. We basically learn that Bryce Wayne fought Metas on her Earth mainly to avenge the death of her boy toy, Sylvester Kyle. She even says, I've hunted and killed plenty of Atlanteans before, since they first appeared on my world years ago. And it's been 18 months since she's hunted down the last of the rogue metas to avenge her Sylvester. And just when she thought she made the world safe, they appeared again led by their queen, Aquawoman, claiming that they come in peace. But no matter what version of Batman you're talking about, they know better, and Bryce was no different. So Bryce suited up and went to war with the Atlanteans, eventually killing Aquawoman with her own trident by ramming it right through her stomach. Killing their queen, she hoped they would get the message. But guess what? They did not. They retaliated by drowning all of Gotham. Because of this, Bryce realized she had to step up her game. So she went through a surgical process to become just like them. She used mutated hybrid DNA to give her accelerated healing, to be able to breathe underwater, and to control water itself. But if that wasn't enough, she then engineered an army to fight by her side, which she called Dead Water, which is an epic name. She did all of this because she had to win. And she did win, but it was at a price. A new way of life and a drowned world. And boom, that's how she became the drowned. She augmented herself because no versions of Batman likes losing. But it came at a price. It's at this point in the book that the Batman who laughs shows up and recruits her to fight with the other Dark Knights to take over Earth Zero, as her and every other negative Earth is destined to die. Then back in the present on Earth Zero, we see the drowned kicking the crap out of Aquaman and Mera. She even turns Mera into a zombie-like creature thing. And just as the drowned is gonna kill Aquaman, Dr. Fate saves him, teleporting him the heck out of there. And the issue ends with the drowned having taken over and sank Amnesty Bay with her version of the bat signal shining into the now sunken bay while she says, I'm gonna drown it all, this whole world, trust me on that. Next up, we have Batman the Merciless, which is a corrupted amalgamation of Batman and Wonder Woman. The comic opens up on Negative Earth 12 with Batman holding a dead Wonder Woman. The caption basically says, it was supposed to be the final war, the last battle between good and evil, but clearly things didn't go well. The comic then brings us to the present on Earth Zero at the HQ of Argus in the War Room, where we see Steve Trevor, Sam Lane, Amanda Waller, and other heads of secret military groups of the DC Universe, all discussing how the heck they're gonna combat all these dark forces forces that a DC Metal event has brought, since all the key members of the Justice League are no help because they're MIA. After some arguing and failing to agree on a course of action, Sam Lane is just like, screw it, we're gonna nuke them with a bomb called Valhalla which apparently can even take down Superman. During this, a security breach happens and the Merciless appears on an upper level. And he just starts killing people left and right, saying, I give them valiant deaths, clean deaths, that only a sword can deliver. It's after this, we finally are taken back to the past on Negative Earth 12 to see how Batman became the Merciless. We learned that Batman and Wonder Woman had been at war with Ares for two years because Ares had forged a new helmet that magnified his powers a hundredfold, which is all kinds of crazy but they were eventually able to defeat him. Unfortunately, however, it came at the loss of Wonder Woman's life. Once the helmet was removed that made Ares so powerful, Bruce decided to put it on, even though Wonder Woman had warned him about its power and ability to corrupt before she died. He says, but at that moment, I saw it, saw the possibility. If I took the helmet, I could wield its power mercifully, with restraint. For the first time, war could just be fair with codes and rules. I would reshape war as its damned god. But we know better. Of course it didn't turn out that way. Because, well, this is the Dark Multiverse. In the months to come, the helmet corrupted him and Bruce would kill those who he normally showed mercy, both enemies and heroes alike. He even says, and I'm quoting here, the helmet showed me that my codes and rules were naive, that all that truly mattered was victory. And just when he's about to storm Olympus, yeah, freaking Olympus, the Batman who laughs shows up and of course recruits him like he's been doing with all the other Dark Knights. After this, we're brought back to the present, where the Valhalla bomb is finally dropped, but it's absorbed by the Merciless, at which point people start worshipping him like a god. Then on the final page of the book, we get a big twist. Ares didn't kill Wonder Woman, he only stunned her. Bruce actually killed her when she tried to take the helmet from him. Bruce says, you reached for it, Diana, for the helmet, so I had to strike you down. These nightmare versions of the Dark Knight are all kinds of ruthless, but we're just getting warmed up because next we have a Batman Doomsday hybrid known as the Devastator from Batman the Devastator 1. Getting right into it, the comic starts off showing us Superman who's trapped in the dark multiverse, with Bruce narrating saying something to the effect of that he should have known not to trust Superman, that he should have seen past the facade of hope and a better tomorrow that Superman supposedly stood for. 
We are then taken to Earth Zero, where Devastator is fighting Lobo, and Bruce is still narrating, saying how stupid it is that other superheroes think to themselves, what would Superman do in a dire situation? Like defending the cosmic tuning fork from Devastator. Although they tried, they failed. Anyway, Devastator kills Lobo by literally throwing him into the sun, which is all kinds of insane. We are then taken back to one day on Earth Zero, where Bruce visits Lois Lane in Metropolis. The problem is, it's evil Devastator Bruce. He tells her, I made it so he could never hurt you again. I need you to listen to me, Lois. I wanted to do what I could never do on my Earth. After this, we are then taken back in time many years ago to negative Earth 1 to see how Batman became this evil doomsday and what the heck he was talking about when he was talking to Lois. We learned that somehow on this world, Superman went crazy and started killing everyone. Batman had tried everything to stop Clark, including using the same kryptonite spear we see in Batman v Superman, which is kind of awesome. What happened was Superman killed his wife, this world's Lois Lane. So Batman was finally like, screw it, I'm gonna kill this guy. So Batman tries to use the kryptonite spear to kill Superman, but Superman cut Batman's arm off with his heat vision. Superman then says something to the effect of, I've heard the other leaguers talk. They said you could beat me head to head if we really fought, if neither of us held back. He goes on to say, with only one look, I could split you in half. With only one breath, I could freeze your heart. With the slightest touch, I could break every bone in your body. And what do you have, Bruce? A spear. Do you understand how weak all of you are to me? And Bruce says, yes, damn it, I do. Batman goes on to say, I really loved you, Clark, and believed in the world you promised, but it was all a lie, and I won't let you hurt me or anyone else anymore. And then Batman freaking infects himself with a doomsday virus he engineered, which he carries in his utility belt because Batman. Then after this, he turns into a freaking Batman doomsday hybrid and starts going to town on Superman. He then blows what I could only assume is some sort of kryptonite doomsday virus mist thing in Superman's face. And when Clark inhales it, it causes massive spikes to burst out all over Superman's body, including one through his chest, all alien style killing the Man of Steel and ending his reign of terror. This origin with Batman infecting himself with the virus he engineered from Doomsday's blood in order to protect the world from Superman is pretty clever. I also really like how they played off of Bruce and Clark's relationship with this one. But now let's see what an evil Bruce Wayne Robin looks like with the Robin King. And I'll tell you up front, this is one of the most twisted versions of the evil Batman. The Robin King's origin is given to us in the one-shot death metal legends of the Dark Knight. And the story starts off at Wayne Manor with a bloody and gun-wielding Alfred who is also missing a shoe. Alfred then says, this is Alfred Thaddeus Crane Pennyworth, recording on Late Master Wayne's Medical Notes recorder. Not in my wildest dreams could I ever have imagined that Wayne Manor, my home for so many years, would become an actual battleground, but it has. And a blood-stained one at that. The most sickening fact in all of this is that the true enemy was me. Alfred then brings the recorder down from his mouth, looking down defeated and depressed, saying every omen, every sign, I ignored. Because he was my boy too, Bruce Wayne, and only by the grace of God was I able to subdue him, momentarily. But in case my efforts are in vain, I wanted to leave something behind to warn Gotham, that its prince is quite mad. You won't believe me, I know he's too smart to let it show. Alfred then goes on to recount times through Bruce's childhood where he saw signs that something was seriously wrong, like the time he bashed a rattle across Alfred's face, making him bleed, or how he would stab his stuffed animals with with his mother's knitting needles. But then it gets even crazier as we see Bruce setting cars on fire. We then see things like Bruce killing his pet goldfish by strangling it with his bare hands and putting a cat in the microwave then turning it on. He also dissected a bat while it was still alive with joy in his eyes, mind you, from the pain he was causing it. But it doesn't stop there. He pushed a man off a ladder, beat a kid over the head with a cricket bat, all cut and dry signs that this kid is loco. Anyway, one night after seeing the movie, him and his parents head out of the theater. And by the way, they didn't see the mark of Zorro in this universe, but rather beware the gray ghost, which is an Easter egg and reference to Batman the Animated Series. And as all BTAS fans know, Bruce's favorite childhood show and idol was Grey Ghost. But in this universe, Bruce is actually complaining about the Grey Ghost. Literally, as they leave the theater, Bruce is saying, I wouldn't have come if I'd known it was in black and white. The blood looks fake. And Thomas, Bruce's dad, says, the film's a classic, Bruce, to which he replies, yeah, classically boring. I just love the contrast how in this universe, Bruce hates it, where in Batman the Animated Series, Grey Ghost is his favorite thing ever. So the way writer Peter Tomasi flipped it here to really show how different this Bruce is was awesome. I mean, if the microwave and cats didn't give it away already, this definitely does. Anyway, you guys know what happens next. Joe Chill comes up pointing a gun at all of them saying, give me your pearls, your necklace, your money, yada, yada, yada. But this Bruce, being the psychopath he is, says, a Glock 17, good choice. Carries two more rounds than a Beretta and is half a pound lighter. To which Joe Chill says, ha, 
I like him. Kid knows his guns. Bruce then says, you're right, as he pulls out a knife and slits Joe Chill's throat. He continues to say, I know a lot of things, like where's the best spot to cut your artery? But it doesn't end there, friends. Bruce then decides to pick up Joe Chill's gun and point it at his parents. His parents are like, put that gun down. What are you doing? And he responds by shooting both of them several times, killing them in cold blood. He then proceeds to take the gun and plants it in Joe Chill's hand so that when the cops come, they'll think Joe Chill did it and that he was also killed in the confrontation. Again, this Bruce is like Cletus Cassidy psychotic. He even says, after killing Joe Chill and his parents, now that's real blood. We are then taken back to Wayne Manor, where Bruce is just looking on a laptop at all the assets he will inherit from his parents when he's 18. And clearly, Alfred is not happy with this. Anyway, moments later, Jim Gordon comes knocking on the door saying that someone had shared files with him. They were encrypted, but his daughter helped him open them. He continues to say, if what they say about the boy is true, and Alfred interrupts saying, it's all true. But of course, this Bruce is not gonna go with the cops. So he literally shoots an arrow from a crossbow through Jim Gordon's throat. Alfred, not putting up with this any longer, then gets into a fight with Bruce, one that ends with Alfred using a tranquilizer gun on him. He literally shoots Bruce several times with it. And this brings us full circle to the first page of the story where Alfred is bloody recording all of this on Thomas Wayne's medical notes recorder. Then as Alfred is continuing to record all of this, we see Bruce come flying through the wall in a Robin costume saying, how do you like my new uniform, Pennyworth? Alfred then falls to the ground, dropping his gun saying, stay back. And Bruce says, thank you, Alfred, for protecting me all this time, keeping me safe until I was ready. And Bruce is saying all of this as he lifts a heavy statue over his head and over Alfred. But Alfred just looks at him saying, go straight to hell, Master Bruce. At which point, Bruce brings it down on Alfred's head and we see blood splatter everywhere. As Bruce says, after you, old friend. We then see Bruce sitting on a chair with Alfred's bloody body next to him while he's ringing a bell saying, hear that? It's the sound of the Robin King. A new spring is coming. Okay, next up we have the evil Batman Punisher called the Grim Knight. He was first introduced in the Batman Who Laughs solo series, and we got his origin in issue two of the title. The issue starts off with Batman forcing Alfred to do everything he can to save the Joker as he shot himself in the heart at the end of the first issue. Alfred is all like, but if we just leave him here, we won't be killing him, Bruce. That's the beauty of it. Alfred is basically telling Bruce, this is our chance for the Joker to die without you having to kill him. But Bruce says, I know how badly you want the Joker gone but the only way to beat the Batman who laughs is by staying true to who we are, whatever the hell it takes. As we see Batman being injected with a bunch of Joker toxin antidotes, like all of them, every single one he has. He does this to keep himself from transforming and becoming all Jokerized. If you don't remember, at the end of the first issue, Joker shooting himself in the heart, released a Joker toxin that infected Bruce. In any case, the antidotes are subduing Bruce's transformation for now. We then see that the Batman Who Laughs is still stealing different Bruce Waynes from other dimensions and killing them, but also stealing their blood and tissue samples to make a serum that can infect a person's cells with dark matter, making nightmare versions of anyone infected. And the latest Bruce Wayne he killed from another dimension was older and the mayor of Gotham City, who was in the middle of celebrating the signing of a federal energy contract in Gotham. After this, we see the Batman Who Laughs sneaking into Wayne Tower, easily getting by a blind doorman at the the elevator. Because the doorman's blind, he's not even quiet about it. The Batman who last even has a conversation with him since, well, he is Bruce Wayne just from another dimension, meaning his voice is identical. Once he gets to the floor he wants, he gets off and starts killing guards left and right chopping off arms, hands, throwing batarangs into people's faces, just wrecking shop. At which point, Batman shows up and the two start squaring off. Batman knocks the Batman who laughs down, getting the upper hand, or so he thinks. It was all part of the Batman who laughs plan, as moments later he was sniped by the Grim Knight who was watching from the top of a nearby building. The Batman who laughs then gets up and says to Batman, don't try to get up. The bullet lodged in your intercostal has a bat taser in it. He continues to say, the Grim Knight, even his bullets shoot bullets. And here's where we get the origin and or backstory to who the Grim Knight is and how he came to be. As the Batman who laughs explains, the Grim Knight is the deadliest man alive. He's us if Joe Chill dropped the gun in the alley and we picked it up. So with this version of Bruce, when Joe Chill dropped the gun after killing Bruce's parents, Bruce got his revenge immediately by picking up the gun and killing Joe Chill, which is a really cool twist on the Batman's origin. Anyway, the Batman Who Laughs continues to say, it's not just the guns though. No, on his world, he has Wayne Enterprises weaponized, chips in your GPS, valves in your water filtration, your minivan drives off a bridge, you never know who killed you. He's us at total war. I've been saving him. What can I even say? This is one of the coolest takes on Batman I've seen. Like it says in the issue, it's Batman at total war. 
like a Navy SEAL military elite Batman that has everything hacked and weaponized to use at his disposal. It quite frankly could be the most dangerous version of Batman we've ever been introduced to. To say the least, I'm very curious to see where they go with him in this story. I think he's definitely going to be a huge part of the story towards the end of the series. That would just be my bet. Snyder has to have some kind of big reveal or twist with him. He's too cool of a character for him to continue only popping up once or twice an issue. I keep using this analogy, but it's like if Batman adopted Punisher's mindset, but even scarier because he's Batman, one of the most brilliant, wealthy, and more importantly, dangerous men in all of comics. So you take away Batman's rule of not killing and then give him the technology of Wayne Tech and access to some of the world's deadliest weapons, that's a scary dude right there. Now we're on to the Dark Father, which is the Batman version of Darkseid. This one is intense, and his story comes in Dark Knight's Death Metal 3 from 2020. Issue 3 starts off with Batman and Wonder Woman's ship crash landing on Apocalypse. It's the composite ship that Toy Master made for them, which we saw in the previous issue. We then see a Brainiac version of Batman, and an Atrocitus version of Batman called Batrocitus, and they're checking the wreckage only to find Jonah Hex, who they think is dead. But he's not, and instead detonates a bomb, killing all of them. We then see Wonder Woman, Batman, and Harley Quinn racing through Apocalypse, as we see the explosion from Jonah Hex in the background. We also see that parademons on this world are Robin parademons, or para-robins. So much so, they even say, holy boom, Batman. Yeah, Scott Snyder is definitely getting all of his fanboy dreams out in this series. Basically, we see that the Batman Who Laughs redesigned all of Apocalypse in his image, as Harley also points out. She even says, I'll say this, Bats, even the evil versions of you are damn good at branding. Wonder Woman then says, the prison should be ahead. If we're going to win, we need him, Bruce. He's still the most powerful hero on our side. Swamp Thing then interrupts and says, Wonder Woman, the Batman who laughs just became something else on Earth. He's been born again. After this, we are finally taken to Superman. Again, this is why Batman, Wonder Woman, and Harley are here to save Superman as they're gonna need him to fight Perpetua and the Batman who laughs. But not only that, we're also introduced to a dark side Batman on this page. That's right, this comic introduces us to a dark side Batman who's referred to as Dark Father. We see that Dark Father has trapped Superman on essentially an elliptical from hell. We also learned that Dark Father has put glass paneling above him that are infused with shades of kryptonite that Superman never knew existed because they're from the Dark Multiverse. And they're shooting kryptonite beams down on him, which is slowly killing his kryptonian cells. But if Superman stops pedaling completely, the glass panels above him will blast him with anti-life, mutating his cells, changing him into a dark side permanently. This is also why one of his arms looks like dark side, because he's slowly turning into a dark side. But wouldn't you know it, Wonder Woman, Batman, Harley, and Swamp Thing show up ready to bust their friend out. But obviously, Dark Father isn't having this, saying, demons, attack, kill them all. Wonder Woman ends up holding Dark Father at bay while Harley Quinn and Swamp Thing start fighting some para robins. Batman then goes to Superman saying, I have an idea of how to get you off this thing. But we see that Dark Father got away from Wonder Woman long enough to point a gun at Batman, but not just any gun. As Dark Father says, remember this Batman? It's my own better version of the gun Darkseid himself used to send you back in time during the last crisis. But I've tuned it to your life force so it won't just send you back, it'll erase you from history altogether. Beings pulled from the dark will remain unaffected, but your friends, your people, no one will ever know you existed. Superman then says, Bruce, look out, as Dark Father shoots Batman, obliterating him with the anti-life being that fired from his gun. But on the next page, Dark Father just looks down at Batman's body saying, why are you still here? As he was supposed to be vaporized. But Batman just responds to watch this next part. Clark. Superman then breaks free from the machine and Dark Father's like, I don't understand. How did the anti-life not affect you? Superman says, it did. I mean, it tickled. Batman's Black Lantern Ring. It controls dark matter. So he just stopped the dead cells from changing. Superman continues to say, hey, Batman, do you think he's ready to retire? Batman says, up, up. And Superman replies, and away, as he uppercuts Dark Father into the atmosphere. I see what you did there. Up, up, and away. I got you, Scott Snyder. Wonder Woman then asks Batman, how did you withstand the anti-life bullet? Batman replies, Bat blocker. I come prepared. I'm fine. He then says, help Scott, aka Mr. Miracle. So Wonder Woman frees Scott and says, we're gonna need you, Scott. We need to save our friends. Where are they? And Superman replies, the super prison. It's right beneath us. Stand back as he lights up his eyes with heat vision. And with Dark Father's origin covered, let's move on to Death Metal Infinite Hour Extreme 1, where we're introduced to one of the coolest and craziest Batman yet, Lobo Batman, otherwise known as the Batman who frags. The comic starts off with Lobo at a bar, a bar you wouldn't want to be at and a part of the galaxy you wouldn't want to be in. And we see this is from six months ago. In any case, Lobo says, hey bartender, whose tentacles do you have to hump to get a drink around here? While grabbing the bartender. Lobo then says, what are you ignoring me? Because believe me, pal, the main man ain't exactly the ignoring type. The bartender then says, I'm not ignoring you, Mr. Lobo, sir. Definitely wouldn't do that. Lobo replies, oh yeah, how come my hand isn't holding some booze? My hand is not used to not holding booze. It makes it itchy. And when that happens, it tends to want to hold 
other things like bartenders by the throat. The bartender then says, I would love to get you a drink, but well, for one thing, you destroyed the bar and beat everyone to death in it. And for another, you use my arms to do it. As we see the bar trashed with bodies everywhere and blood spewing from where the bartender's arms used to be. Lobo then says, like that's an excuse while grabbing a bottle of booze for himself, continuing to say, you're a bartender, figure it out for frag's sake. Lobo then says, none of this would have happened if somebody would have told me where my bounty was. The bartender then says, actually, he's right there. You beat him to death before anyone could tell you who he was. Lobo's like, I did? Cool. Less work for me then. Now never let it be said that I'm some sort of bastard who doesn't cover his debts, Captain Armless. This should cover the drink and the bar, as he throws one of his arms back at the bartender. The bartender then says, but wait, this isn't my arm. And Lobo replies, yeah, well, I'm not going to sift through all the arms I just ripped off in here to find yours. Take what you can get. And as he finishes his sentence, Lobo gets ripped through a portal. And on the next page, we see he was ripped through said portal by Lobo Batman. And Lobo says, oh, great. What the frag is this now? Frazetta Batman? And when Lobo starts finally getting up on his feet, he says, listen, Bat Bastage, or whatever the hell you call yourself. I don't know what your problem is, and I don't care much, but I got me a bounty to collect, so if you'll excuse me. At which point, Lobo Batman starts beating the crap out of Lobo before slamming him on his back, saying, you're excused and about to be abused. And it's at this point we get the origin of Lobo Batman. This Batman says, as for who I am, let's just say I'm a Batman who injected himself with Zarnian DNA, and in the process added your strength and healing factor to his already impressive skills and fighting prowess, which made me the multiverse's worst damn nightmare and the mainest man of all, the Batman who frags. And that, my friends, is the origin of the Batman who frags. It's super brief, but his origin nonetheless. But now let's continue because their confrontation does not end here. Lobo and the Batman who frags then lock up with their weapons as Lobo says to the Batman who frags, ooh, scary, you got me wetting myself in my leather pants here and everything. I mean, really, what's up with all you different bat stooges showing up lately anyway? Like one of you uptight bat fetish losers wasn't enough. The Batman who frags then headbutts Lobo extremely hard in the face saying, you thought you could out headbutt me? Please, you do know it's still Batman in here, right? Which means from the fiery pits of Apocalypse to the beer and urine soaked streets of Sturgis, I've trained with the greatest headbutters who've ever butted. Lobo replies, which makes you the ultimate butthead. The Batman who frags says, speaking of butts, you seem mighty happy for someone who just got his handed to him. And Lobo says, look down, as we see somehow he impaled the Batman who frags with his own bat shaped hook and chain. Lobo then charges the Batman who frags to start cutting him open even more saying, get ready to become the Batman who's missing a spleen punk. But then out of nowhere, he gets teleported away yet again saying, what the? Getting pulled in? Freaking no, I had him. And then we see on the next page, Lobo land on a floating rock in space where someone says, welcome Lobo, my apologies for the rough ride getting you here. It's not how I usually like to do things, but then again, these are unusual times. As the cloaked figure takes off his hood, revealing him to be Lex Luthor. Lobo says, I'll give you unusual times, jumping to the rock Lex is floating on, saying, how about an unusual kick to your bald ass head? What's the big idea of bringing me here like this? Lex looks at him and says, I have a special mission for you. Lex then opens up his shirt, revealing some arc reactor looking thing on his chest that's projecting images of the multiverse, saying, everything is at stake. And when I say everything, Zarnian, that's exactly what I mean. If you do not take this mission, it all ends. Everything. Lobo's all like, everything, huh? Well, on one hand, that'll get rid of a lot of people I don't like, like Superman and every kind of Batman. Also, Guy Fieri. But on the other hand, it'll also be curtains for stuff I do like, like babes, dolphins, brew, myself, and hell, money. He then says, all right, Lexi, you got my attention, but now who the frag would be getting the bad news that the main man was coming for them in this scenario? Lex replies, not who, a what? Death Metal itself. That that's right, friends, if you've been reading the main death metal title, you know that Lobo has appeared in several issues and was revealed to be gathering death metal for Lex Luthor. Well, this is giving us the origin of how that happened, essentially the how and why Lex hired Lobo to do this for him within the main death metal series. In any case, Lobo then says, death metal? Huh, well, don't that sound expensive? Lex replies, Lobo, you'd be getting paid handsomely if that's what you're hinting at. Lobo replies, it is, and it's all I needed to hear. I'm in. Now there's just a matter of a ride. Them floating rocks don't exactly seem like they get too much in the way of miles per hour. Luthor replies, it's all been taken care of, as a space chopper appears for Lobo, to which he says, you done good, Lexi, as he heads out to find a death metal for Lex Luthor. We are then taken back to the Batman who frags, who's pulling the bat hook out of his chest. And when he does, he says, that bat stitch got away. He then hops on a space chopper saying, and that just don't happen to the bat main man. I also have to mention that he's dragging Two-Face, Mr. Freeze, and Penguin's bodies with chains. Also, a Lobo looking Joker head is mounted on the front of his bike. So that's the thing. He continues to say, yeah, somebody's about to learn the hard way, so something every single resident in my Gotham is well aware of. The Batman who frags don't ever send anybody to Arkham. He sends them to hell. And he says this while licking his bloody hook, finishing his sentence saying, better get that suntan lotion ready, Zarnian. 
This brings us to part two of the comic titled What the Frag is Death Metal Anyway? Here we see Lobo in search of death metal on Black Hawk Island, where he gets into a fight with Black Monday, aka Solomon Grundy Batman. Black Monday is trying to stop him from getting the death metal, but Lobo is able to beat him by causing a building to collapse on him. Lobo then runs into Hawkman who's guarding the metal, who at first was prepared to fight Lobo from taking the death metal, but ultimately Hawkman says, I can't keep it hidden forever, maybe your fate's help, and our only hope. At which point he gives him the metal, and as soon as he does, the Batman who frags in his bat plane starts shooting missiles at Hawkman and Lobo, because obviously he was able to track Lobo down. As explosions are going off all around them, Hawkman says, quick, I set up this portal, though to be honest, I'm not quite sure where it leads. I'll stay back to hold them off. And Lobo says, oh no you're not, you're coming with me through this mystery portal, big boy. The Batman who frags then flies away in his plane thinking he killed Lobo, but in actuality, Lobo and Hawkman were taken to Gemworld which is full of unicorns and all kinds of crystals. Hawkman then tells Lobo, I was ready to die back there. I had made my peace long ago. Lobo then interrupts saying, suck it, Carter. Nobody cares. Now this is the part I've been waiting for as he opens the box containing the death metal. And when it does, it gives him the power to rewrite history. So Lobo starts messing with characters' backstories like Superman redoing his origin, having John Kent say when he sees Superman's rocket land in a cornfield, look, a rocket, probably dangerous. I know, let's drive right up to it. Once next to it, he then says, watch me touch the stupid rocket like a fracking clown, while Martha Kent says, I love to be a dumb idiot. And when they open up the rocket ship, it reveals a baby Lobo. He then writes himself into Batman's origin saying, surprise Clydes, it's a crime in Crime Alley. Who'd have thunk? Making himself the one who killed Bruce's parents. And he does the same sort of thing with Wonder Woman as well. Then all of a sudden, a giant hand starts making its way through another portal, pulling Lobo through saying, this is worthless nonsense. And we eventually see the hand that's pulling him through is Brainiacs, who was secretly sent by Lex Luthor to ensure Lobo relinquished the death metal. But of course, having all this powerful metal Lobo has to mess with Brainiac, putting him in a granny's dress, to which Brainiac says, does not compute. While Lobo continues to mess with Brainiac, the Batman who frags shows up, yet again shooting Lobo saying, remember me? I got an unforgettable face. You can't keep a good Lobo down, as he starts shooting Lobo. But this time, Lobo gives the Batman who frags a boot to the face, and then throws him inside of a pocket universe. Brainiac then just looks at Lobo while still in a dress saying, Lobo. Lobo's all like, what? And Brainiac says, I believe you know what. Lobo then says, fine, and puts Brainiac back in his normal outfit. Brainiac Maniac then says, restored. The inflection point approaches Lobo, the moment when existence hangs in the balance. The key to everything is in your blood. Lobo replies, in my blood? Brainy, maybe you're actually as smart as you think you are. I think I have the most extreme idea yet. And then in the epilogue of the issue, we see Lobo sent the Batman who frags to an alternate universe where he lands in front of the Hall of Justice, where he says, yeah, dumbass, I'm still alive. You can't keep a good Lobo down. I'm gonna get my revenge and I'm gonna frag you. But out of nowhere, someone punches him saying, surprise, Clyde. And then on the final page of the issue, we see it's a Lobo Justice League beating the crap out of the Batman who frags while he screams, no. Now that does it for Lobo Batman, so it's time to move on to the origin of the most notorious of all the evil Batman, the Batman Who Laughs, which of course is the insanely powerful Batman-Joker hybrid. His origin was laid out in the Dark Knight's Metal tie-in issue, Batman Who Laughs issue one. This is not surprisingly our favorite evil Batman origin, and it really demonstrates how dangerous and deadly a twisted Joker Batman would be. The comic opens up with the Batman Who Laughs talking to someone from across the table. He's telling this mystery person, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you really thought you had it all figured out that you knew every combination, and it would thrill you every time you got it right. The Batman Who Laughs goes on to say, but this isn't any of those stories. They're familiar parts, but they're all in the wrong place. And there's nothing more frightening than when all the cards lay out on the table just right, but then another card comes and changes the meaning of the entire hand. And there's no way to know what's gonna happen next. The second page throws us right into his origin many years ago in Gotham City on Negative Earth 22. We see that the Joker has Batman drugged to be physically weak, but not mentally, as he still wants Batman to be coherent and take in all the chaos and destruction he's causing to Gotham City. For instance, he's blowing up all the hospitals, killing other supervillains like Catwoman, Penguin, and Killer Croc, or you know, telling Batman how he literally dissolved Jim Gordon's eyes, and as he was torturing slash killing him, Jim called out for Barbara with his last words as his jaw was melting. What the hell, Joker? First the killing joke, now this? Joker really hates Gordon no matter what Earth he's from. Anyway, the Joker's killing every cop and every villain. And then we see him saying there's no by the book anymore and that they're running out of time. So Batman and the Joker need to evolve. Basically, he's going all out like never before, literally killing everyone, even recreating the death of Bruce's parents right in front of his face by shooting this little girl's parents right in the head and then Jokerizing the little girl. Keep in mind, all of this is going down 
down while Joker has bombs blowing up hospitals. And he's doing all this for the joke too far. The joke that will push Batman to his breaking point to make him kill the Joker. Joker even says, it has to exist, Bruce. I know it does. Needless to say, it finally works and Batman snaps Joker's neck with the tightest headlock ever. But when he does, Joker gas is released from his mouth. Two days later, when Batman is talking to Superman, we find out that the chemicals that made the Joker the Joker were killing him which pushed him to take things way too far and why he pushed Batman to his breaking point. Batman then says that the Joker wanted to make something new out of the best of both of them. Batman and Joker's trauma blended together. We then see a panel where Batman laughs after Superman tells him that a Jokerized little girl tried to bite the throat of her psychologist. That's not a good sign, people. Then three days later, Batman tells Dick, Barbara, Jason, and Tim that he was infected by the gas that was trapped inside the Joker's heart and that it's changing him and rewiring his brain. He says if the process is allowed to run its course, he will have the same highly ordered mind he's always had with the moral core replaced with Joker's. When they're all like, don't worry, Bruce, we can figure out a way to cure you. He's like, no. Plus the real reason I gathered you all here in the cave was to kill you, as you all would be the first to notice I was changing. And then he mows them all down like Scarface with machine guns. Freaking insane. We then see that one week later, Batman has killed almost the entire Justice League with weapons from the League's trophy room that they gathered from enemies over the years. Of course, Superman is still hanging on, but not by much. Batman then says to Superman, I'm disappointed I only get to kill you once. Do you realize how many ways I know how to kill you? We then see that he's also brought Superman's wife and son, Lois and John, to the freaking watchtower. Why did he do this, you ask? just so he could give Superman a modified piece of black kryptonite, which made Superman go crazy and kill his own wife and son. I know, all kinds of crazy town. Anyway, before long, the Batman Who Laughs world was coming to an end. And around this time, he meets Barbados, who shows him Earth Zero and how there's a Batman who lives out there. We then see the Joker talking to the mysterious person from the first page at the table with all the playing cards. He's telling this person that he thinks the Joker was right to a point, that the two of them needed to evolve into something new together. He goes on to say, Joker used to call me the Bat King ruling over my dark kingdom. And what is a king? Really, it's a powerful card, the highest value card in the deck. Not infallible, to be sure, but potent. And the Joker card on its own has no inherent value. It's defined by what it's played against. Dangerous and potential more than anything. But if you hold the two together in a hand, they can hold nearly any value. They can shift and adapt to any threat they face. And so can I. He goes on to say to this bandaged person, that's what's so frightening. You know I've already won against any hand you could possibly play against me. The Joker who laughs then asks a freaking terrifying question. Could it get worse? Do we have one more card up our sleeves? You want to see it, don't you? But you're terrified at the same time. And then he reveals, are you ready for this? This is actually really huge for this DC Metal event. He reveals every nightmare this multiverse has ever had and says they're coming. Up until now, DC Metal has been purely about evil versions of Batman. But now they're bringing in evil versions of every Justice League member. My mind is blown. We see an evil Superman parasite hybrid, a Superman dark side, an evil Flash, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and so on. Again, my mind is blown, guys. The comic then ends with him telling this bandage chained up person, to win, you need to adapt. And to adapt, you need to laugh away all the restraints, everything holding you back. You see, a Batman who laughs is a Batman who wins. But now let's go back to past eras to see what happens when the Batman who laughs evolves into the darkest night in the Legends of the Dark Knight's one shot. It starts off with us getting the Batman who laughs perspective from a scene that happened in Death Metal issue two, where a bunch of evil Alfreds from all over the dark multiverse are operating on him, putting his brain inside of a Bruce Wayne Dr. Manhattan body. If you wanna know why they're putting his brain inside of a Bruce Dr. Manhattan body, check out our episode for Death Metal issue two right here. Anyway, the Batman who laughs then says to himself while looking up at the bright lights over the operating table, I'm aware of what they will say to me before they say it. The first will ask if it worked, the second will ask if I'm here, and the third will wanna know if I could hear them. And guess what, he was right because all three Alfreds ask him all of that in the exact order that he stated. The Batman who laughs then says to himself, and I am here. No, I am no longer the Batman who laughs. I am something more. I just need to figure out what that is. We then get a giant splash page from the Batman who laughs who's going through Batman's history, starting from the night his parents died. And he's saying how a hero was born from tragedy, from bullets fired in a dark alley in Gotham. He then talks about how he swore an oath on his parents' grave to avenge their deaths by protecting others from their fate. He goes on to say how Batman trained for years, crafting his mind and body into the perfect weapon and eventually came back to Gotham to fight alongside incredible allies and defeat incredible villains. But at the end of recapping Batman's origin, he says, but if I were the Batman 
Batman of the real world, Earth Zero, this is where my story would end. But I am not Batman. We then get another huge two-page spread where the Batman Who Laughs is telling us about his dark multiverse and how on his universe, he ended up killing the Joker, but the Joker had one final joke. You see a toxin in the Joker's heart released upon his death, a toxin that would make whoever killed him the next Joker making Batman the Batman Who Laughs. The Batman Who Laughs then continues telling us how Barbados came to him and taught him the nature of the dark multiverse and how there was a true stable multiverse above it where the real Batman lived. The Batman, which all the Batmans down here were twisted reflections. He then says Barbados planned to drag the multiverse down into the dark and destroy it. So the Batman Who Laughs convinced him if he wanted to bring the world to heal, he needed more dark Batman. So the Batman Who Laughs found his first Dark Knights, his own justice League of Batman. But of course, the Batman who laughs had his own agenda. When the heroes of Earth Zero won the battle against Barbados, he would not let himself be dragged back into the dark. You see, the Batman who laughs predicted that Barbados' actions would free the great mother of the multiverse, Perpetua. So he engineered a plan to usurp her chosen right hand man Lex Luthor so that as she rose, he would rise with her. But even being Perpetua's right-hand man, he knew he still lacked the power to fight back should she turn against him. And he knew he could only keep the heroes of Earth Zero at heel for so long. And that Wonder Woman would one day rebel and cut him down. And she eventually did. And there ended the story of the Batman who laughs. But as he says, I am not the one who laughs either. Not anymore. I am something else made from the one dark Batman that I told no one about. The Batman who laughs goes on to tell us, see, while I was still him traveling the dark multiverse in search of nights, I saw one echo of a Batman I hid from everyone. A Bruce Wayne who after encountering an incredible energy tied to a button from another universe decided to replicate that power. I then watched him build the intrinsic field generator unaware of its true power or what it might lead to. I watched as the experiment began to go awry and as he went to set it right I activated the machine. It took months for that Batman to pull himself back together molecule by molecule. A power strong enough to create and destroy worlds. A Batman Hatton. But it only took seconds for my energy knife to lobotomize him before he grew powerful enough to see me coming. And so I had my path to ascension. The Batman who laughs now in the Batman hat and body says, I feel my awareness expanding as my mind takes hold of its new body and I am ready to take my final form. He then says, I am not only aware of my entire life, but the life of every twisted Batman in the dark. And I will put aspects into myself from the most terrifying, the most vicious and be something new. Yes, I will be the culmination of human evil and a cosmic weapon of infinite power designed to win at any cost. I draw in the many lifetimes of experience and knowledge, and so I explore Batman after Batman. He goes on to say, in a way, I become each of them, and I learn from the dark nightmare lives, each of the ways a Batman could be pushed to fail, and I stitch their experiences and skills into my mind, becoming more and more powerful as I push deeper into the dark. Until suddenly, it dawned on me, a revelation, clear as day, a simple truth I never saw before this moment. He then tells us that the Batman has always been a reactionary idea. He was born in response to those gunshots in the alley. And just as he has reaction, so does all the twisted Batman of the dark. Even the most dominant of them are still a reaction to some fear that has shaped him, built him into some new, crueler incarnation, perfectly designed to overcome it. And now this ascended Batman who laughs understands this, and even says, I now know that I am not a Batman of any kind. Not a Batman who laughs, not a Batman Manhattan, not even a combination of all the dark Batman. I am more. And to be more, I must not be a reaction. I must be the thing that creates the reaction. I will be the bullet. The multiverse will be the dark alley and its world still fall like pearls before me. I just need to stop for a second because holy crap, this is awesome. The dialogue for this issue and the Batman analogies he's making to relate to the Batman's origin is so good. Hats off to Scott Snyder, Josh Williamson, and James Tynan who wrote this story. Well done, my friends, well done. Anyway, this ascended Batman who laughs then says, the speedster with the touch of Manhattan, I will take his power and then rise up and create my own multiverse. A multiverse that laughs. Every planet like a bullet to be fired at gods like Perpetua. A multiverse that will eat all other realities after reality until there is not one being in the omniverse but me, the darkest night of all. It's at this point we are taken back out of his mind and onto the operating table where the Alfreds are looking at him saying, thank God, it's really you, isn't it? Say something, please. And the Darkest Knight says, bang, with an evil smile as the story ends. Yes, this is easily among the most powerful versions of Batman to ever exist in comics, evil or not. In fact, he actually went on to slug it out with Perpetua, the mother of the entire multiverse. So, you know, that should tell you what's up. Regardless, that wraps up our Origins compilation of the evil Batman from the Dark Knight stories. Thanks for coming along for the ride and let us know which evil Batman is your favorite in the comments below. Otherwise, we'll see you next time when we talk about all things comics.